Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kari Boyd, and I'm the Executive Director of Operations here at Faith. In this week's message, The Greatest Story Ever Told, Pastor Rusty talks about the greatest challenge humankind has ever faced. Now, here's the sermon. So I'm just wondering who's ready for some preaching? Huh? You know, I... I just got to tell you, I have been uh, wrestling with this message all week long and, and in a good kind of way, and, and I'm anxious to deliver it to you on God's behalf, but I'm, I'm also anxious to see how you respond to this. So here's where I want to start with all this, y'all. You know, people have different thoughts and feelings and ideas about the Bible, okay? Some people wonder what the Bible's really all about, and some people think they've got the Bible all figured out. In fact, some people are actually convinced that this Bible is is so old and archaic, there's absolutely no way that it could have any real relevance for their life here in the 21st century. Some people think the Bible is just fictitious. Some people think it's simply symbolic. Others think that every single word is literally true. Where I want to start today is to let you know that I think the the more full truth of the matter is this. There are parts of the Bible that are symbolic. They point to something else. And there are parts of the Bible that are literally true like the Ten Commandments thou shalt not kill or steal or 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 bear false witness those aren't invitations y'all those aren't suggestions those are commandments that have been given for for our protection for our own good I'll say more about that later but what I'm really wanting you to hear is this the Bible isn't either or it's both and Because you see, the Bible isn't one single document. It's actually a collection of a lot of different types of literature, a a, a lot of different genres of writing. For example, some of the Bible is historical and biographical, and that's going to be a little more literal in terms of its, its intention and meaning. Some of the stuff that we have in the Bible are actually letters that were written from a specific person to a specific person or community about a specific issue. Some of the stuff that we have in the Bible is beautiful poetry. Some of the most beautiful poetry you've ever heard. In fact, let me just tell you this. If you want to woo somebody, start reading the Song of Solomon. Mm. That's good stuff. Some of the stuff in the Bible are songs that were really meant to be placed to music. That's what the Psalms are all about. There's wisdom literature in the Bible. There's apocalyptic literature in the Bible. That is literature that points to something that hasn't happened yet. You see, the Bible is all of this and then some. But what the Bible is not is fictitious. That means without truth. The Bible's not fictitious, y'all. Every single piece that is within the canon of Scripture is meant to be a part of the greatest story ever told. The greatest story ever told. The story about God who is with us and for us. The story about who God is and what God promises for all of us. You see, this, this greatest story ever told is meant to reveal why God made us and who God has called us to be. To answer that existential question, why on earth are we here on earth? I mean, all of that is meant to be a part of the, the story that we have in the Bible in its entirety. A story about a God who made us, saved us, and liberates us so that we can fulfill our potential, so that we can fulfill our destiny if we'll let God do what he does best, which is to guide us, lead us, and direct us. So this morning, what I'd really like to do is start at the beginning, both literally and literarily in the book of Genesis. That's where I want to start today because you know what? I want to talk to you about the greatest challenge that humankind has ever faced And that greatest challenge is, wait for it, wait for it, drum roll please, come on, and clashing of symbol, the greatest challenge that humankind has ever faced is sin. What'd you think I was going to say, huh? 
is sin. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. That's what I'm going to be reading from first, beginning in verse 1. This is what we hear there. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than, all, than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, that is Eve, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, Well, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, or you must not touch it, or you will die. Puh. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Now, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and was pleasing to the eye, and oh, by the way, was also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So that's where I'm going to stop reading for now. And, and look, I'm fully aware that this part of the story involves a talking snake. And that seems on the story to be a bit fictitious, okay? I mean, I don't want to run into a talking snake, do you? Huh? But I also don't want to go forward with you thinking that this story is simply symbolic in some way because I'm telling you right now, it's much more fundamental than that. It's much more in foundational than that. It's much more important than that. You see, it's in this part of the story that God reveals for us the strategy that the enemy, that is Satan, both an enemy of God and humankind, the strategy that the enemy employs to get inside our head and our hearts. The strategy the enemy employs to destroy our lives and to rid us of our full potential. The story of the strategy that the enemy uses to try and kill and separate us from a relationship with God. Because listen, when Satan tries to lead us away from God, he's not going to do that in an obvious, overt way that we can easily recognize, y'all. Huh? His strategy is much more intentional than that, much more subtle than that, much more deceptive than that. You know, when I was a young Army officer, a more senior officer who became a great mentor of mine once pulled me aside and said to me, Rusty, if you want to be able to defeat your enemy, you have to first discern your enemy. What he was trying to tell me is that if I wanted to be able to command effectively and defeat the enemies that I had to face, I had to be willing to understand how my enemy thought, what my enemy tried to do, and, and, and what capability my enemy actually had. And you know what? That's a lesson that hasn't just served me in a military career in days gone by. It's a lesson I think God wants to equip us all with right here, right now, starting with the book of Genesis. If you want to defeat your enemy, then you have to start by discerning your enemy. Because I'm telling you right now, okay, Satan is not going to bully you into disobedience. That would never work, would it? You're not going to be bullied into anything. You wouldn't stand for that. You wouldn't let anybody else bully you into anything, would you? Satan is not going to be able to bully you into disobedience. So he doesn't even try. Instead, what he does is try to lure you and me with questions that will entice us to go to places we think we really want to go or, or, or to do things that we think we really want to do or worse. Oftentimes, he will entice us into believing that the places that Satan wants us to go and the things that Satan wants us to do are actually places and things that God wants us to go and do. And then it's, well, then it's even worse than that. He's not going to overtly try to bully you into disobedience. And at least that's the way it happened in this story that we have in Genesis, right? It started with a simple question. And that question was, did God really say? Right? I mean, that's what we heard in verse 1. 
He said, now the serpent, the more crafty and all the wild animals, yada, yada, yada. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from the tree, any tree in the garden? Did he really say? See, that's how the enemy works, y'all. He asks a simple question, and yet he tries to sow the seed of doubt in your answer so that as that seed grows, it begins to lead you to disobedience. At least that's what happened with Eve, right? He asked Eve, did God really say? And I think Eve tried to answer him as honestly as she knew how. I mean, I think she wasn't trying to play games. I think she was trying to answer as honestly as she knew how. But here's the thing. He took her answer, twisted it and interpreted it so that he could plant the seed of doubt in Eve's heart. And then he tried to also appeal to Eve's uh, desire so that she would be disobedient. Let me show you what I mean. So picking, up, picking it up in verse 2, now the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees uh, in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said. See, he's planting the seed of doubt in her, in her head. You won't die. I mean, he said you would, but, but you won't really die. For God knows that when you eat it, uh, that you eat from it with your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Don't you really want to be like God, Eve? See, now he's appealing to the desire of her heart. And that's the way the enemy likes to work in our lives, right? He likes to plant the seed of doubt so it will lead us to disobedience. Because see, here's something that I've learned, y'all. I've learned in my own life, in my own experience. I've learned that Satan cannot uh, undo the promises that God has made. He doesn't have that power. He never has and he never will. He simply cannot undo the promises that God has made. But I'll tell you what he can do and I'll tell you what he does do, at least in my life, is he likes to put question marks over the promises of God so that I begin to doubt their validity. So that I begin to question God's intention in, in the promises that he has made. Because you see, if, if, the, if the enemy can get me to begin to doubt, then he can lead me to begin to disobey. And if I begin to disobey, then I will begin to, to move away from the life that God has, is trying to call me into. I want you to understand today that the enemy has an agenda. That agenda is to steal and kill and destroy the purpose that God has for your life, for your family, that he has for your vocation or your, or your business that you're in. He, he wants to steal and, and kill the purpose that God has for your spirituality. He wants to do that for your sexuality and turn it into something that, that, that is altogether perverted and, and, and undesirable. And it all starts with a simple question. Did God really say now before I go on I want you to understand this if you have no idea what God has actually said you're going to have a really hard time answering that question and even if you do you're going to have a hard time answering that question faithfully and safely but I'll come back to that in a second so did God really say because you see if Eve had answered that question, did God really say in a way that she was able to, uh, re to, to, to say exactly what God had told them, then this story might have turned out really differently. I'd like to show you what I mean by that. So let's turn back to Genesis chapter, uh, actually chapter 2, just before we picked it up, because I want to show you what God actually said, Okay. Back in chapter 2, verse 16, here's what it said. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. That's what God actually said. Now, here's what the, the, the enemy asked in chapter 3. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Do you see the subtle difference? 
huh see what God actually said is that you may eat from any tree in the garden period any tree every tree and then he said but don't eat from the one in the middle of the garden the the, the tree of, of, of the knowledge of good and eat. don't eat from that one because if you do that won't turn out well for you that won't be good for you your eyes will be opened and you will certainly die so you see what, what's, what the enemy does is he reframes what God actually said. God said, you may eat of any tree. And he asked, did God really say you may not eat of any tree? What God did is he said, you can eat of anything and everything, but not everything in this garden is good for you. In fact, to tell you the truth, we hear that same truth elsewhere in the Newer Testament when the Apostle Paul writes to the early church and he says this in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. He says, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are permitted, but not all things build up. Isn't that exactly what God said in the book of Genesis? You may eat of any tree in the garden but don't eat of that one because that one's not good for you see and, and that's listen I know I'm spending a lot of time on the subtle difference but that's exactly how the enemy works you see he wants to make sure that, that, that we understand that God is a God of limitation that God is a God of rules and, 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 and regulations and restrictions when in truth what this book of life proclaims is that God is a God of liberty and freedom, that he's a God of, of provision and, and blessing. But the enemy tries to take the, the promise of God's liberation and freedom, and he tries to turn it into limitation. He tries to turn it into limitation. When the reality is this, my friends, God does give us a few limitations I guess if you want to use that word but they're always for our protection I mean that's what I was talking about when I talked about the Ten Commandments right you see the problem is is that we believe the lie of the enemy that the Ten Commandments and others like them are rules and regulations and and restrictions and and we just want to rebel against that but the truth of the matter is and I've said this before can you imagine a world where everybody keeps all ten of those commandments think about it for a minute no killing, no lying, no stealing. And every kid obeys their parents. Come on, you got to love that. You got, I, I, I got to get an amen from somebody. I'm just saying, you, I want you to see that the law, the, the commandments aren't given to restrict us. They're given to protect us. It's very different. But we believe the lie all too often even in the church maybe especially in the church we've believed the lie that we have a God that limits us that regulates us that co somehow corrals us and restricts us huh? I'm, I'm, look I'm not telling you anything that I don't think you already know see the church has taken this book of life that's meant to proclaim the freedom of God the goodness of God the generosity of God and we've turned it in to a law book We've turned it in to, 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 a, to, to some kind of mortgage contract where if we'll do this, then God will do that. And if we don't do that, then God will foreclose and we don't want that. Huh? Or worse, we've turned this into a baseball bat where we start slugging people across the head with it and telling them how they should live their life, how they must live their life. And then we wonder while we're raising young generations that want nothing to do with the church because we spend more time telling them what they can't do what they should do what they must do what they can't wear to church whether they can't drink coffee in the church and I see some of you drinking coffee in the church and I just want you to know right now it's okay <laughs> it's perfectly okay but we tell our children what they can and can't do we, we, we've institutionalized rules and regulations that we, that we tie to this book when in truth we have a God that has already said you can eat from any tree in the garden. Just keep in mind that not all those trees are good for you. A God that says through Paul, all things are lawful. Just not all of them are beneficial. 
So I'm wondering today. I'm wondering what God's doing in your life. You see, what God gave to Adam and Eve was altogether good. He created for them paradise, y'all, and put them right smack dab in the middle of it. You know what? They wandered around naked all day without one bit of shame or self-consciousness. And tell me you don't secretly wish you could live that life. Come on, be honest. You wish you could secretly live that life. But the enemy came along and began to, to, to insinuate that God's intention wasn't all that good. He began to insinuate that God was holding out on them. That He began to insinuate that, 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 that God didn't have their best interest at heart. And so they ate and they disobeyed. And you know what happened? Exactly what God promised would happen. Notice I didn't say that what happened was God punished them. What happened was what God said would happen all along. Their eyes were opened. They knew the difference between good and evil, and they were ashamed. And I want to be clear about this one point, y'all. They didn't become ashamed because of their nakedness. That's what a lot of people want to, uh, want to reduce this story down to. They didn't become ashamed because of their nakedness. I know they took fig leaves and, and you know, made the first Victoria's Secret lingerie. I got it. But that's not what their shame, their shame was because of their disobedience. Their shame was because of their sinfulness. Their shame is because they finally had the knowledge of good and evil and they knew they had crossed the line. That was their shame. I wonder what's going on with you these days. Huh? What question marks has the enemy placed over the promises of God in your life? Huh? What doubts are you wrestling with today? I'm wondering, what shame are you burdened with? What, what shame is really holding you back? You know, if the story ended right here, it would be a tragedy. In fact, I would say it like this. If the story ended right there at verse 7 where I left off, it wouldn't be a very good story because it would be a, sto a story about defeat. It would be a story about hopelessness. And we know that all good stories end in victory, right? All good stories end in triumph. All great stories are really triumphant. And I've already told you this is a part of the greatest story ever told. So the story doesn't end here, my friends. And that's the good news I want to announce to you today. It doesn't end in verse 7. So I'm going to pick it up in verse 8. Now then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man where are you and he answered well I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid and God said who told you that you were naked have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from and I'm gonna stop reading there but let me tell you what happens next Adam did what every husband in a compromising position would do he blamed his wife. And Eve reciprocated in kind by blaming the snake. And that's a whole different sermon that we'll have to come back to at another time, y'all. But my point is this. The story didn't end with their disobedience because God came looking for them. God came searching for them and God had a simple question of his own and that question was where are you where are you now don't think for one minute that God didn't really know where they were all along he didn't create them out of the dust and not know where they were okay he knew exactly where they were he wasn't asking the question for his benefit he was asking the question for theirs because you see the problem is they didn't know where they were they felt lost. They felt ashamed. They felt alone. 
They never dealt with that feeling before. They were hiding in their shame. They had placed fig leaves on their body, but, but listen, that, was, that is symbolic because what was really going on is they were trying to hide from the reality of their sin. That's what they were really trying to do, and God knew that. And yet, he came and he said, where are you? I'm just wondering, who in this house today is grateful that you have a God that will come looking for you and searching for you even in your dysfunction and your disobedience? Who's, who, who's grateful for that? Keep your hand up. Because who I want to also know, who's grateful that you have a God that will come looking for you even when you're ashamed, even when you're hiding out? Who's grateful that you have a God whose love endures forever to such a degree that there's nothing you can do or say that's big enough, bold enough, or bad enough that God will not come asking you, where are you? I long for you. Yeah, me too. You can put your hands down now. All right? I just want to make sure I wasn't alone in that gratitude. All right? Because I think that's, listen, I think that's important that you understand that you have an enemy that's always going to ask a simple question in order to plant doubt in your life that will lead you to disobedience, but you have a God that's bigger than your disobedience that will always come and say, where are you? Come home. Where are you? Because I'm wondering, where are you today? What fig leaf are you using to try and hide the reality of your sinfulness, your dysfunction, and your disobedience? We all have it. I don't need you to affirm that. I don't need you to raise your hand. I already know that's true for each and every one of us, but I'm wondering, what's holding you back today? Is it your doubt? Is it your hurt? Is it your anxiety? Is it your uncertainty at something that you're struggling with? Maybe it's, it's the fear that you have of the unknown. I don't know. I, it was all this and then some for Adam and Eve. But God didn't just come and say, where are you? He asked, I think, an even more important question. He asked the question, who told you that? Who told you that? Say, I don't know what you're struggling with today. I don't know what you're wrestling with. I don't know what your situation, your circumstance, I don't know what your ism, schism, or otherwise deep dysfunction is. And trust me, I don't know that I want to know all of it, okay? But here's what I want you to know. I want you to know that God is still asking that most important question to each and every one of us as well. Who told you that? You know, some of you are probably struggling with the mistakes that you've made in the past and you're thinking, I I'm just, I'm unworthy. I'm, un I'm unworthy of all this love and, and, and mercy and, and grace that, that the pastor keeps talking about, that the worship leaders keep singing about. I'm unworthy of that. Well, first of all, I want you to tell you this. Okay, God wants to say, well, who told you that? Because what I've told you here is that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and, and I've also told you that I sent my son Jesus Christ to redeem you no matter who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. Who told you that your mistakes define you? Your mistakes don't define you. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ defines you. Your faith in him and him alone is what has saved you and defined you. You see, that's why grace is grace, because you don't deserve it but God desires it. Some of you are struggling with being a good parent because you didn't have a particularly good childhood. Maybe you didn't have great parents yourself and, and, and you're thinking, well, I'll never be able to do this parenting thing because I, I don't really know how to do it right. And God, here's what God wants to say to you. He wants to say, who told you that? Was it the enemy that told you you couldn't be a good parent even though you didn't have a very good childhood? Because what God says is this, I, God, am the father to the fatherless. I love the orphaned. I love the abandoned. I give hope to those who are hopeless. I give strength to those who are weak. Who told you? Who told you that? Maybe somebody in this room today, you're struggling with your body. You're thinking that you look undesirable, that, 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 that you just, you're just not happy with who you are, and, and you think that, that because you're not happy with your body, you're not, you're not worthy of respect and dignity in the world it's because the enemy is whispered in your ear but God wants to say to you today who told you that because in this book God has said that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made 
What he declares is that he has made us with his own hand, from his own heart, and for his own purpose. Who told you that your body defines who you are? It's the spirit that God has placed within this mortal shell that we all have that has eternal life, eternal existence. Or, or, or finally, maybe somebody in this room today is, is really struggling hard with trying to come to terms with life in a broken, sinful world. You're thinking that just because your life is in the ditch that this is as good as it gets. You think that, that maybe, maybe, maybe you're getting older in life. I'm going to share this out of personal experience. Maybe you're getting a little bit older in life. Maybe your mobility is, is not what it once was. Maybe your eyesight is beginning to go a little bit. And you're thinking, the best days of my life are behind me. Well, here's what I want you to hear. God says, who told you that? Who told you that the best days of your life are behind you? I don't care how old you are. Because the truth that this book says is that we were made eternally. That we have the gift of eternal life. Which means that our best days are always in front of us. I mean, always in front. Yes, y'all, look. I can't promise you that, that your bodies won't begin to age and slow down, maybe even break down. Mine is more than I'd like to admit. But here's the truth. My life is more than just this mortal shell and my best days are ahead of me and so are yours. And, 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 no matter, and no matter where we are on this journey, God still has a plan and a purpose. You need to hang on to that. In fact, that's what I really came here to declare to you today. No matter what you're struggling with, no matter what you're wrestling with, no matter what you've done, no matter how ashamed you are, no matter what you're trying to hide from, I came here to declare to you a truth. The devil is a liar. He's an absolute liar. And you need to tell him to just slither away. Seriously. When he asks you, did God really say, you tell him what God has really said. You tell him that God has said you are wonderfully made. You tell him that God has said that, that you have been redeemed. You tell him that God says that he will be with you. He will never forsake you. You tell him. You tell him that God has said that he will never forsake you or leave you. Because when you tell the devil the truth, he can never change the promise that God has already made. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we, we acknowledge the truth of who we are. We're fickle people, easily manipulated, easily deceived. We're people who oftentimes give in to the doubts that are in our heads and the desires that are in our hearts. We oftentimes get it so miserably wrong. And yet we've also come here today to acknowledge the truth of who you are. You are a God of freedom and liberty. You're a God of, of infinite chances. You are a God who says, I am with you and for you no matter who you are, where you've been or what you've done. I am a God who will never forsake you. I am I am. I am I am all those things and you are mine today Lord we want to make sure that we understand what you said so Lord we, we, don't, we don't read this book of life we, we don't encourage each other to read this book of life out of duty and obligation because we should do it we, we don't read this book of life so that you will love us more you can't love us more than you love us right this very moment that is a hundred percent for all time and eternity. And yet you have given us this book as a gift so that when we're confronted by the enemy with the simple question, did God really say? We'll know. We'll know what you said. We'll know what you meant. We'll know the promises that you made. And we'll receive the joy and the peace that surpasses all understanding. We'll receive the gift as you intended it to be received as a pure, unmerited gift of grace. 
we do believe that all things work together for good for those that love and trust you that's why we're here we come here because we trust you even when we can't trust ourselves we come here because we believe you not just believe in you but we believe you we've come because your son Jesus Christ has beckoned us to come and be gathered come and be strengthened so that we can come and be sent into a world that needs to hear the truth of who you are not a God of limitation not a God of restriction not a God of rules and regulations but a God of mercy love power and strength for everyone and I mean everyone. In Jesus' name, we pray this thing. And everybody said, Amen. That concludes this week's message, The Greatest Story Ever Told with Pastor Rusty. If you would like to come to one of our services, we are located at 6000 Morris Road, Flower Mound, Texas. Our service times are 845 for our liturgical worship and 1030 for the contemporary worship. Hope to see you here at Faith.